Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another installment of our Creation and Evolution series here on the Kennedy Report. Of course, coming at this from a traditional Catholic perspective. It is no secret that I myself am a creationist, a young earth creationist, that is. Um, but today we're going to do a deep dive into the narrative about the sort of ancient hominids, um, uh, especially, and how that plays into the evolutionary narrative. And if there are problems with these so-called hominids. Perhaps you took an ancient history course or something like that in high school. I know I did. And I was told about Australopithecine and all the Pithopithecus and Pithopithecine and all these different ones. And it was a dogmatic fact that we had to accept, but there might not be as much certainty as we've been told. I'm joined today by John Wynn, who is a kind of a jack of all trades in the uh, traditional doctrine of creation apologetic world. Um, he has his own work in his own ministry as well and has been an associate of the Colby Center for a long time. John, thanks for joining me. I'm glad to be here, Kennedy. Thank you for having me. Excellent. And uh, the audience will get a special treat today because they'll have a little bit of a Canadian accent. Mine's not too strong, and they got a Southern accent, so we're going, we're going international here. <laughs> We've got it covered, don't we? We got it covered. And uh, so, John, before we get started, why don't you give us a little bit of a background of how you got into this niche of this uh, um, incredibly, incredibly important yet not so widely known world of Catholic apologetics on the doctrine of creation. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I got involved in this whole issue of origins in 1999. I lived in the uh, Kansas City area at the time, and in the state of Kansas, there was a a uh, proposal by what was called the Citizens Committee. And they were asking the state school board of Kansas to allow challenges to Darwinism that was presented as fact in, in the classroom. And this proposal was interesting because it was not proposing to bring in Genesis into the public school classroom because they knew that was a, a that would never win the day. All they wanted to do was to allow information from the scientific literature. When and when I talk about the scientific literature, we're talking about periodicals such as Nature, Science, Journal of Human Evolution, and so forth. They just wanted permission to challenge the textbook claims in biology textbooks uh, with information from the scientific literature. Well, this created a firestorm, it, literally international in scope. They had film crews come in from as far away as Japan and try to try to explain who these, these you know, backwoods people were that would dare question Darwinism. And I happened to work with a, a man named Ken, who was part of the Citizens Committee, and he uh, invited me two or three times to be part of the committee and and just to work in developing strategies to present in front of the or arguments to pre present in front of the school board to to win their their uh, their petition. Well, I refused at the time, and I watched this debate play out all through the summer of 1999. And as I watched, I continued to, to become more and more convinced that there's a lot going on here besides science. And I, I came to realize that really the, this, this claim of human evolution and evolution in general is part of an integrated worldview of humanism that dominates public schools it has for more than a century. And so, of course, the humanists in control of the, the education in America are not about to allow any challenge to their basically their religion into the classroom because they, they want to indoctrinate students in all areas of thought. And foundational is the, the notion of human evolution and evolution in general. So I, I, I watched that play out through the summer. By August of 1999, the, uh, the citizens lost their case to get uh, the right to challenge Darwinism in the classroom. But just as that, that case was being decided, I, I felt more and more inclined to uh, start focusing and study this area. I, uh, I worked with my younger brother, Stephen, and it took us eight years, but we finally in 2008 published our first book uh, called Repairing the Breach. And I've uh, published, I, I think, five additional books since then, focusing on things from uh, the Catholic teaching on evolution to the philosophy behind um, the claims for evolution, which interestingly involved more than just the athe atheistic materialist worldview. They also involved the philosophy of rationalism introduced to the world by Descartes in 1637. We might delve into that in a little more uh, detail as we go along here. But basically, uh, that is the focus of, of our ministry is to 
uh, engage in the battle, the war worldviews. And uh, as you mentioned, I've worked with Hugh Owen. Uh, we met in 2009. And since then, he and I work closely together. Uh, I helped him put on the Colby Conference, which is an annual, annual conference every year. And uh, we, we made presentations and uh, together, and he also carries our books. Um, you can also find our books at our website, restoringtruthministries.org. So there's a brief background, Kennedy. Excellent. I'll make sure um, when we're done recording this, I'll make sure to make a note to put the link for all those books in the description area of this podcast, whether people are watching on YouTube or listening on one of the audio platforms as well. Restoring, That's restoring Truth Ministries, correct? Correct, yes. Restoring okay. Truth Ministries, yes. You know, it's funny you mention, um, well, before that time, were you sort of like someone who accepted in general the evolutionary narrative? Uh, were you kind of for it or against it? Where were you on that spectrum? I would say I was just um, ignorant about where the real evidence lay. Um, I was I was raised a Catholic, but was fairly lukewarm, I would say, until probably my uh, my late 30s. Uh, it was in 1987 where I'd actually made the decision to uh, to leave the church. I went to a, a Promise Keepers event out in Colorado and and was just convinced that that was the right thing to do. But the Lord spoke to me on the last day of the conference and told me I could not leave because I have not given the Catholic Church my all. So I remember crying about 12 hours all the way back to Kansas City. And um, in, in the back of my mind was this thought that someday in the future, I would be asked to write for the Catholic Church. And I didn't really know what form that would take. That was in 1987. So it was another 12 years before I really understood what that, that calling would turn out to be. Excellent. But but yeah, I, yeah. When, when I got involved, I really didn't know. I was curious because I understood the philosophical importance of whether or not we can take the Genesis account in the straightforward literal sense, which is what we're told to do in Providentissimus Deus and mm -hmm. say, going back to St. Augustine. Um, but then I would hear other people say, well, we don't have to take that creation story literally. And the assumption was that there was evidence uh, from the field of paleoanthropology that supported notions of human evolution. And so I very quickly got um, involved in that specific question. Is there fossil evidence to support notions of human evolution? That's excellent. You know, one of the, the sort of red pill moments for me, so to speak, I wasn't like a committed evolutionist, but I was very lukewarm and all that kind of, it's very similar. But when I started taking my faith seriously, I wrestled with this question of Genesis. And, you know, it's funny, the the book of Genesis kind of brought me back to the church. Weirdly enough, I was, when I was away from the church in my kind of early twenties, I'm 35 now, it was about 10 years ago, nine years ago or so. I kind of came back whole hog to the church. And, um, when I was away, you know, I was looking for truth. I was listening to podcasts, Joe Rogan and all these people who are just kind of famous and whatever, talking about sort of alternative things. I always, didn't have much time for the mainstream media to give myself a, a little bit of credit. I wasn't always a brainwashed person, so to speak. But but uh, in those conversations, they'll talk about aliens, they'll talk about, you know, ancient civilizations, all that kind of stuff, which is fascinating. Um, but they also talk about evolution a lot. When I, one night, I remember this like it was clear as day. I was laying in my bed beside my wife. We were just married. She was asleep. I was actually a mover at the time, working a summer job during university. And uh, I, I just opened up the Bible to page one. It was actually on a browser, so I kind of opened up the page on the browser. And I think it was the King James Version, funny enough. It was just BibleGateway.com. And I read the first chapter of Genesis, and it was like the words came off the page. And I just, for some reason, said to myself, this is all true. Like, I, it wasn't, you know, I didn't have a rational argument. I just said, this is all true. And I didn't know what to make of that because I was supposed to be an evolution, blah, blah, blah. And... One of the big red pills for me as I'm a language major, that's my, my study background, was language acquisition. And I remember thinking, because I had this linguistic professor one time that told me of these studies where essentially after the age of about 11, 12, 13, if someone's not learned to speak a language, it's basically impossible. They have certain case studies where for some reason someone didn't learn a language, usually for tragic reasons, but nonetheless, they can basically kind of speak it a little bit with weird pronunciation. They can never make the sounds with their mouths properly. That muscle just can't develop. And I thought to myself, okay, if these are non-rational creatures, they're not going to have language and they're definitely not going to be able to transmit the language to their kids. 
And I just thought to myself, there's just no possible way we could have language. That was a big thing for me. And that was kind of the first red pill. But today, we're going to get deep into the problem of the hominids. Um, would you like to share the screen now? Should I put that up for you? Sure. Let's look at that. Sure. All right, so what, what I propose, Kennedy, that we do is go through um, this claimed timeline of human evolution. If you go through the scientific literature, you'll basically see claims of uh, the lifespan or the duration of various species uh, in the homo genius. So we're, here we are, homo sapiens. We were, according to the scientific literature, said to have evolved into homo sapiens about 300,000 years ago. But if you go back further in time, times represented here by these dashed lines, and then I've got this bold in bold here, the timeline that shows how many millions of years ago any particular species lived. So for example, it, once we talk about Homo rudolfensis, we can see that he was claimed to have lived between about two and 2.4 or 2.5 million years ago. His um, descendant was supposedly Homo habilis, who lived from about 2 million years ago to 1.7 and so forth. Um, so we'll talk through those two. We'll talk through Homo erectus. And that'll be a, a rel relatively lengthy discussion. And then these remaining uh, claim transitional forms will go pretty quickly uh, leading up to Homo sapiens. If we go down below this timeline here, and see some of the uh, claimed species in the Australopithecus genus um, that were said to have evolved to, into Homo about 2.5 million years ago. And a couple of the, uh, the species that we'll focus on, one will be Australopithecus africanus. Sometimes you'll hear this uh, referred to as the Tong child. This dates back to a 1924 discovery in South Africa. And then probably the most uh, famous Aust Australopithecus is uh, Afarensis. If you've heard of the the nickname Lucy, yep. Uh, this this was Afarensis. He was discovered in 1974 by uh, Donald Johansson, and is is still claimed to be the mother of us all. So we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about her as well. And then uh, if we have time, we might get down to. Uh, uh, Artipithecus ramidus. This was a, a discovery uh, that came to the into the uh, the scientific literature. It was announced, I think, in 2008, 2009. Artie is the nickname of that claimed uh, transitional form. So as we talk through these various um, uh, claimed hominids, we'll we'll go back and forth from this timeline and kind of mark these off as we go. And then we have some uh, some pictures here. This is from my book called. Human Evolution, the Astonishing Record, and we'll go through and, and look at some of the photos uh, that are used to support the evolutionist case as we go. Perfect. All right, go for it. Okay, all right. Well, you know, before we begin, I, I may suggest um, just addressing a question I hear a lot when the topic, topic of human evolution comes up in Catholic circles. A lot of times we will hear claims that, well, you know, evolution is is not really important to Catholics um, whether evolution is true or not we can we can reconcile that with our faith either way uh, it's kind of a fundamentalist thing to even worry about evolution whether it's true or not but that that should really be a pretty quick discussion all we have to do is is refer Catholics to paragraph 282 on the uh, the catechism uh, let me just read that briefly sure paragraph 282 says, Catechesis on creation is of major importance. It concerns the very foundations of human and Christian life, for it makes explicit the response of the Christian faith to the basic questions that men of all times have asked themselves. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our origin? What is our end? Where does everything that exists come from and where is it going? The two questions, the first about the origin and the second about the end are inseparable. They are decisive for the meaning and orientation of our life and action. So there's, from the catechism, uh, very clearly points out the importance of the question of origins. 
So we can we can just reason, well, if origins is an important topic, certainly the truth about origin is also very, very important. And that leads us directly into our uh, discussion of the hominid evidence here. Excellent. All right. So let's let let's begin now going down the timeline. I'm going to actually begin with this. Uh, if you can see my cursor here uh, by Homo habilis. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came into the field in 1999, we took a survey of more than a dozen bio high school biology textbooks, and Homo habilis was the most often cited transitional form in the biology textbook. So we're going to start there. And you can see here on the right uh, a picture of a skull of Homo habilis. And you can see certain features of interest, for example, a pretty low dome on the skull, very uh, prominent uh, eyebrow ridges here, and this jaw with, with uh, very um, ape-like looking teeth that, is, that protrudes very far from the, the, uh, the, the eye sockets there. So that's a picture of Homo habilis. And so let's talk about the story of Homo habilis. It actually began in the year 1960. That's when um, the famous Louis Leakey made a find in Africa. And in nature, he wrote that, um, that it was uh, the species we are dealing with from um, his find is a single species of genus Homo and not an Australopithecine. So right away, he claimed that Homo habilis uh, was not ape-like at all. It was very clearly on the way to becoming uh, becoming modern man. Hmm. Um, he finally published a detailed uh, article in 1964 in Nature. And what is interesting is that the, the claims immediately came under fire in the scientific literature. For example, in, 19, in 1965, uh, right in Nature, an anthropologist named James T. Robinson uh, made a very important uh, analysis of the fossils. And here's what he said. Uh, and, and before I read this, understand that the fossils that uh, Leakey found, they were in two strata or layers of, uh, of earth, and these were called bed one and bed two. So here's what Robinson said after he evaluated the fossils and the circumstance around the find. He wrote in Nature, <clears throat> It must be remembered that two groups of specimens are involved, one from bed one and the other from bed two. So two strata and there are two groups of, of fossils associated one with each bed. It is therefore by no means clear that the bed one and bed two groups of specimens necessarily belong to the same species. It would seem that there is more reason for associating the bed one group of specimens with Australopithecus and the bed two group with Homo erectus than there is for associating the bed one and bed two groups with each other. So what he was claiming was that Leakey had found some fossils that were Australopithecus or very ape-like, and he found other fossils that belonged to Homo erectus, and he mixed the two fossils together, and therefore it's not surprising that he would have claimed to find a transitional specimen that looked partly ape-like and partly human-like, but, but that's what we would call an invalid taxon because he's combining two different uh, species in order to claim that he's discovered a transitional form. So that, that would immediately invalidate any claims that Homo habilis was, uh, was indeed a, a valid species that was you know, on, the, on the pathway to becoming modern man. Now, one thing that is, is interesting is that before Homo habilis, uh, uh, were, were, as, as soon as he was identified, this was before the time that Homo rudolfensis, if you can see that on my timeline, had been discovered and named. And therefore, the uh, evolutionists speculated that Homo habilis would be very uh, much intermediary between uh, Homo erectus and some of the Australopithecine uh, genus, genuses or, or species that were very ape-like in nature. But when Leakey made his find, we hadn't seen found any post-cranial uh, fossils of, of, of uh, very many fossils to that point. So it was it was pure speculation that uh, Homo habilis would end up, you know, 
being found out to be halfway between the, the, the weight and the height of early homo fossils and the Australopithecus. Well, finally, in 1986, uh, postcranial uh, fossils of homo classified as homo habilis were found, and it was discovered that homo habilis was even shorter than Lucy, the presumed uh, predecessor of homo homo habilis. So the, the evidence uh, came to light that, yeah, something's not right here because of it doesn't really, the size of Homo habilis doesn't really fit the expectations. Well, ever since that time, uh, an increasing, uh, I would say, number of evolutionists have admitted in the scientific literature that Homo habilis really is not a valid uh, uh, species and should probably, the fossil should probably be sunk and placed in Australopithecus genus. For example, in 1999, when I first started getting involved in this issue, Science Magazine read, read an article that said, um, for various reasons, Homo habilis should, should probably be eliminated from the Homo classification. And I'll, I'll just read you some of their, some of their arguments. Uh, first, it was said that Homo habilis uh, cannot be assumed with any degree of reliability to be more closely really related to Homo sapiens than to the Australopiths. Second, the estimated body mass, so we're talking weight here, of 33 kilograms is well below that of Homo sapiens of 58 kilograms and Homo erectus of 51 kilograms. Third, the hand bones of the type specimen and long arms of other fossils suggest that Homo habilis was capable of proficient climbing. <laughs> um, and for this reason, they said, you know, the fossils really should be removed from Homo and transferred to the genus Australopithecus. All right, that 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 basic uh, conclusion has followed. In uh, 2011, for example, another article in Science concluded, and I'll quote here: In the past decade, the handyman status that's referring to Habilis has been undermined. Newer analytical methods suggested that Homo habilis matured and moved less like a human and more like an Australopithecine. Now a report in the Journal of Human Evolution finds that Homo habilis's dietary range was also more like that of Lucy's than that of Homo erectus. In a separate commentary this week in the uh, publication of the National Academy of Sciences, Paleoanthropologist Bernard Wood writes that today, if one considers all the evidence, there are grounds for excluding Homo habilis from Homo. So uh, there's more detail in, in the books, but basically what we have concluded or conclude from what I've read is that Homo habilis was very likely a mix of uh, Australopithecine and Homo fossils, the original finds. As more and more finds have, have uh, come forward, what has been uh, concluded by most evolution is that the fossils really do not belong in Homo at all. They belong uh, rather reassigned to the Australopithecus genus. So, so let's, that's our first. So let me just inter yeah. uh, uh, summarize here for the, for the layman like myself who are having their minds blown with all these big words. So essentially, this is the thing that I always find so strange about this is I was told growing up with science, you're not supposed to make assumptions. You might make inferences, but you don't try to fit those into paradigms just because you think they might fit. You're supposed to really test it. And then from sort of as close as you can get to some sort of indisputable conclusion, you say, well, this must be the answer. But with this, they're going looking for clues to fit the narrative that they're already predisposed to believing. So that for me is a red flag just from a basic uh, perspective of the philosophy of how you do science. Furthermore, when you actually look at the timeline of when these, uh, you know, specimens are discovered, um, very quickly, they become circulated within the conversation in the evolutionary science world as if they fit into a particular box. And that is kind of, I mean, you know, they're, it's kind of like modernism in the church. Uh, they don't say it's de fide, but they act as if it's de fide. So when you kind of call them on it, they will say, well, I didn't actually say it was de fide. It's like, well, your actions speak louder than words. Acta non verba, as the Latin phrase goes. But then very quietly, if needs be, they can bring them out of that and put them into a different box, and then they can claim that the science is constantly evolving. So they want to have their cake and eat it too. That's how I'm seeing it. Absolutely right. Um, I think the more you, you study the evidence, the more you realize what 
how, how weak the evidence really is. There is a lot going on behind the scenes, including philosophical bias, um, the quest for fame and funding for uh, pro digs in Africa. Uh, just everything adds up to provide all kinds of incentives for these evolutionists to put, to put forth claims that are really not strongly supported at all. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, shall we continue then sure. with our list here? So we, we've gone through Homo habilis. Let's turn now and look at Homo rudolfensis. Now, this, this particular uh, species claim is very interesting because we can see that it's the first claim species in the Homo genus. Um, it supposedly evolved and came on the scene about 2.5 million years ago and presumably would have evolved from one of the candidates here we have in the Australopithecus genus. So let me just give a little background here about Homo rudolfensis. Um, he's claimed to have lived about 2.5 million years ago. He was uh, discovered by Richard Leakey, who's the son of Lewis and Mary Leakey. Uh, and he uh, discovered, made the finds in Kenya uh, in 1968 and 1969. Um, he continued digs thereafter, and it was in 1971 and 1972 where he found a number of fossils that were soon to become quite famous. One of these I'll show here. This is the, uh, the skull that is uh, identified as KNMER 1470. So I'll probably refer to him as 1470 for short. The KNMER stands for Kenya National M Museum. East Rudolph, uh, talking about the location where the find was orig originally made and where the fossils were were stored once they were uh, they were uncovered. So let's talk about some of these fossils. What is really interesting is that if we're talking about the very first uh, Homo transitional form, we would expect it to be very primitive, would we not? Mm. Uh, since it was the first species that evolved from the Australopithecus genus. However, what is interesting is that the finds, especially from the 1972 uh, season, have been consistently described by multiple scientists who have studied the fossils as reminiscent of modern man. Mm. So if we go over here and look at the, the fossil here, you can see a very high uh, cranial dome compared to Homo habilis, right? Uh, if you saw a profile, you would see that that the specimen had a very flat face. And a very important uh, measurement is the cranial capacity, which is a proxy for the, the brain size. Homo rudolfensis, th this, this particular specimen, 1470, was uh, measured or estimated to have a cranial capacity of about 775 cubic centimeter. Well, a very important question is, is that within the range that we see for Homo sapiens? As it turns out, Homo sapiens has a very large range of cranial capacity, depending on the particular individual. Uh, commonly, you'll see claims for a range from about 800 uh, cubic centimeters up to 2,200 cubic centimeters. Some estimates go down as low as 700 cubic centimeters. And actually, the the uh, smallest cranial capacity of a human measured uh, about 600 and uh, I think it was 660 cubic centimeters of a human with normal intelligence. So Rudolfensis, the, the specimen 1470, was on the lower end, but it, uh, of human of the of the human uh, range of cranial capacity, but it was within that that span. Uh, Homo habilis, for uh, on the other hand. His cranial capacity was usually in the 500 to 600 cubic center, centimeter range. So there was a dramatic difference in both morphology or shape, as well as just the overall cranial capacity of Homo rudolfensis. Uh, I'll just read some, read some of the de descriptions here of 1470. Uh, Leakey described it as remarkably reminiscent of modern man, lacking the heavy and protruding eyebrow ridges and thick bone characteristics of Homo erectus. So he was saying that Rudolfensis was even more human-like than Homo erectus, with erectus was the presumed descendant of Rudolfensis. So it was a very uh, surprising find, led to a lot of de debate in the evolutionary uh, 
uh, establishment as, as to how this fossil should be classified. One of the other uh, interesting things is, is that the skull on the interior of the skull had what's called a Broca's area, uh, Bro Broca's area, which is unique to humans, and it lies lies above the left temporal lobe and controls the muscles allowing articulate speech. Now, again, hmm. this is unique to humans, and so there was this big question: Well, how can how can on on, on the one hand, how can we not classify this 1470 skull as Homo sapiens? On the other hand, given the estimated age of over two million years, uh, how can they possibly classify it as, as Homo sapiens? So there was a lot, lot of debate about uh, how these fossils should be classified, um, and the, the debate really continued until about 1986 when this Homo rudolfensis classification was created. Now, there are other fossils that were uh, attributed to the Rudolfensis species that are also of, also of interest. There was a second skull discovered uh, and labeled 1590. This was discovered in 1973. And the interesting thing about 1590 was that it had approximately the same cranial capacity as 1470, but they could tell that the individual that they labeled for, uh, 1590 was only about eight years old at the time of death. That they, they can tell that through uh, just the dental remains and other, other characteristics. So here you have an eight, eight year old uh, specimen that, that died, but it already had a cranial capacity within the range of, of, uh, of Homo sapiens, and the, it would have increased further had, had the specimen lived beyond. Uh, eight, eight years old. There are other uh, other fossils that were uh, described as very human-like or Homo sapiens-like. One was um, a uh, was labeled 1481. This con consisted of a complete left femur, and it was described um, as uh, let's see, ha having widely char considered characteristics of. Uh, of modern man homo, homo sapiens. So again, not only do we look at cran cranial evidence for resemblance to homo sapiens, but the postcranial material, femur and other leg parts were also described as, uh, as identical or very closely uh, related to homo sapiens. So again, the question was, well, how do you classify these fossils? Eventually in 1986, uh, this classification of Rudolf Fenzes was uh, was developed and uh, they continue to find Rudolf Fins's fossils that uh, that are placed in that that species largely based upon the dating of the fossils. I, I should mention here that we're using the timeline put forth by evolutionists, even though I think as you mentioned, you have you, you have reason or we all have reason to doubt that the dating methods producing these ages, these long ages are valid. But when I do my work, I, I continue to use the claimed uh, timeline or age of the fo fossils put forth by the evolutionists because um, we can show that even if we did accept their dates, the fossil evidence just falls apart upon close examination. So ha had we not have this time element, the dating results, there really would be no reason to um, have a separate classification for the Rudolf Fins's fossils. They rightly belong to Homo sapiens. Um, so that, that's very, I always found that very interesting that the most ancient of the, uh, of the Homo uh, species uh, really is very, very similar to Homo sapiens, even more, uh, more so than Homo erectus, its presumed uh, descendant. Yeah, that's excellent. And um, as we record this, um, the next episode that will air in this series will be with uh, Kevin Mark, Dr. Kevin Mark, DDS. He's a dentist, fellow Canuck. And we did an episode. Um, we've already pre-recorded it, but it'll air after this, talking about the evidence for a young earth. So we are taking this evidence at face value. And I actually have a gentleman... Um, uh, coming on later in this series. He's actually a PhD in evolutionary biology from Oxford and a Catholic. I think he's the only one who's ever existed. And um, <laughs> he's coming on my show to argue against the uh, evolutionary theory from a purely biological perspective. And um, I don't know if you can get somebody more qualified than that, a PhD in the evolutionary field from the arguably most prestigious university in the world. And he show he's going to show us um, using the old earth paradigm, because here's the thing, when you argue this stuff from a young earth perspective, the theistic evolutionists and the evolutionists in general will just not take you seriously. 
they'll just say, you know, I'll right. I'm just not going to do it. And fair enough. Okay, fine. We're trying to do the truth here. So we'll, we'll play the game with those rules in order to do it. So this is really important to show that even if we take their numbers, we still have major problems. And what we're probably seeing is just animals, you know, just various types of animals. And these things are fit into the paradigm, which they don't even really fit in. That's right. Yeah. The Australia pithecines, to, to get to the conclusion now, they're really just extinct primates. They didn't evolve into anything. They simply went extinct as many other species have uh, in, in the past. Yeah. Have yeah. nothing to do with human evolution. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what's our next one? All right. Our next one is Homo erectus. And we're going to spend a little bit of time um, talking through this species. It's probably the most important claimed transitional form. You see a, a photo of one of the Homo erectus skulls here. And if we look at our timeline, Homo erectus was said to have a very long duration uh, coming on the scene about 2 million years ago. And we're showing here that the common claim is that, oh, by about 300,000 years ago, maybe a little bit less, uh, Homo erectus uh, kind of faded away. And that's when Homo sapiens came on the scene. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Homo erectus. Um, he was one of the early fossil finds. Um, this, uh, the, the first fossils, and these are commonly referred to as the Java Man, Java Man find. This occurred in 1891 and 1892 by a Dutch physician named Eugene Dubois. And he went to uh, the island of Java. And it turns out he, uh, he went there with the specific intent of finding man's ancestor. And so he went um, and started digging along the Solo River. Uh, later expeditions realized that where he was digging, it was simply a, a bone pile deposit that would, would occur as the river flooded and carried dead, you know, dead carcasses and so forth down. And so Dubois had a, a, a huge amount of fossils to choose from. And it turns out that what he uncovered was a modern looking femur and a primitive looking skull cap. Well, it appears that the skull cap and the femur were not necessarily from the same individual because they were likely found between 40 and 50 feet apart. But nevertheless, Dubois thought this find was significant because it had a very modern looking leg and yet a very primitive looking skull cap. So he combined them together to form his so-called Java man hmm. and claimed that he found uh, you know, a transitional form leading to Homo sapiens. Well, what is interesting is that when Dubois brought the fossils back uh, to Europe and showed them to the uh, scientific community, everybody agreed that, yeah, the skull cap did look uh, uh, somewhat uh, primitive, uh, very much like uh, this this. Uh, photo here of, of Homo erectus skull. But the interesting was, thing was that the femur was indistinguishable from that of Homo sapiens. And subsequent finds uh, or, or studies on the femur have come to the exact same conclusion. There's no reason to classify this femur as different from uh, Homo sapiens or in, to put it in a separate classification of Homo erectus. But this raises a really interesting question, doesn't it? Dubois thought that both the skull cap and the femur were both of, of the same age. He estimated about 1.5 million years old. Hmm. But how can that be? I mean, if we have a skull cap that dates to 1.5 million years and a femur that is indistinguishable and, and should be classified as Homo sapiens, how can we say that Homo erectus eventually, gradually, around 300,000 years ago, evolved into Homo sapiens, when there was an individual <laughs> that was that should be classified as Homo sapiens based on, on the femur that was found, there was a Homo sapiens that lived at the same time as Homo erectus. Right. This happens, this happens again and again, and it's what we call the contemporary status question. So again, the, the question is, how can erectus gradually evolve into Homo sapiens 300,000 years ago if, in fact, there was evidence that Homo sapiens lived alongside Homo erectus 1.5 million years ago. Years ago. Mm. Um, one of the, the early anthropologists who studied the fossils had, had this to say about the femur and its classification. 
He said, I refuse to let myself be influenced by considerations concerning the sediment or age. A bone which shows all the characteristics of a human bone must be considered as such. Mm. When after determining this, it is said that the bone could have belonged to an intermediate species, one is abandoning the domain of facts without any plausible reason. And the deeper you dive into the fossil evidence, the more you realize that there are many fossils classified as something even older than Homo erectus, maybe as an Australopithecine, even though the fossils are indistinguishable from modern man. For example, there's a, a fossil that was uh, discovered in the 60s called KP271 that dates to 4.4 million years ago. There's easily half a dozen or more studies in the scientific literature that say that this, this fossil is indistinguishable from that of Homo sapiens, and therefore, really, there's no reason not to classify it as anything but Homo sapiens. But if that was widely done, then all of these intermediate transitional forms here would just be shown as, as invalid and not leading to modern man. Same thing, there are all kinds of artifacts, uh, you know, rocks that were used as axes or anvils that date um, older than three million years ago. I mean, the evolutionists admit that the Australopithecines didn't have the dexterity to make those kinds of stone tools. So they're really left in a lurch trying to explain where the, who these artifacts should be attributed to that, that are uh, dated by them more than three million years old. So let me just let me just add some context here. So this, ladies and gentlemen, this brings up a whole host of problems because if it's true that the Homo sapien, i.e., us, if it's true that we are in the millions and millions and millions of years back in history, then there are a whole host of other questions that have to be raised that completely d uh, discredit massive uh, portions, let's call it, of this um, narrative. Because uh, explaining a stagnant level of population for literally millions of years with virtually no growth, when you think about the low levels that there would have been compared to what we have now, um, uh, basically no progress technologically for millions of years. I mean, all of these things have never been seen in human history at all. Yet somehow, if we are to admit what the evolutionists themselves say, that there is strong evidence based on their paradigm that... Homo sapien is going back in the millions, then we basically have this period of two to three million years of kind of this black hole in history where nothing like we know about human beings takes place um, and we're just supposed to kind of forget about it. So there's, there's, there's big demographical problems, there's historical problems, as well as evolutionary problems from the basic scientific perspective. Absolutely, absolutely. And let, let's continue to talk about Homo erectus and we'll see more problems um, come up regarding the 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 uh, story of Homo erectus. All right, when we start to look into uh, the fossil evidence in the scientific literature, we will see uh, fossil after fossil described from Homo erectus and classified as erectus simply because of the age. And yet the descriptions clearly indicate that erectus was uh, uh, indistinguishable from Homo sapiens in a number of ways. Let me just read some of these excerpts from the, from the book here, and you can start to see how all the body parts seem to fit uh, very closely with, with Homo sapiens. Uh, in his book, Physical Anthropology, Gabriel Ward concluded that Homo erectus is distinct from modern man, but there is a tendency to exaggerate the differences even if one ignores transitional or otherwise hard to classify spe specimens and limits consideration to the Java and Peking population, the range of variation of most features of Homo erectus falls within that of modern man. So again, the question is how can you classify these fossils as anything but Homo sapiens if they fall within the range of Homo sapiens? A 2015 article in the Journal of Human Evolution evaluating the shoulder construction of, hem of Homo erectus concluded that all Homo erectus fossil clavicles fall within the normal range of modern human variation. These data support reconstructing, reconstructing the Homo erectus shoulder as modern-like 
and suggests that the capacity for high-speed throwing dates back nearly 2 million years. Another study in 2015 in the Journal of Human Evolution uh, evaluating a hand bone fossil that was found in Spain and dated to uh, was dated to approximately 1.3 million years ago was attributed to the Homo genus, but no specific species uh, was, was assigned because the article concluded that there are no essential differences between the fossil and comparative fossil specimens for the genus Homo after 1.3 million years ago. We argue that the modern hand morphology is present in the genus Homo subsequent to Homo habilis. So basically they're saying by the time that this fossil uh, specimen lived about 1.3 million years ago, the hand was essentially modern. Mm -hmm. uh, a 2011 article in the Journal of Human Evolution included, concluded that endurance running may have been possible from a thermal regulatory viewpoint for Homo erectus. Um, there are, are many more examples in the books here of the hands, the feet, the shoulders, all aspects of the Homo erectus fossils do fit within the range that is currently seen in Homo, uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, another very interesting find was in 2003, there was an article in Science Magazine that discussed the first ever Homo erectus fossil that enabled researchers to uh, glimpse a Homo erectus cranium base, the base where the, the spinal column comes into the, the uh, cranium. And the conclusion was that the Homo erectus uh, uh, specimen was unexpectedly modern in anatomy. In other words, they were expecting to find a spinal column entering far back in the, uh, the cranium base, uh, uh, producing a kind of a humped over look like we, we often seen drawn, but that wasn't the case at all. It was, it was very much uh, similar to uh, the way Homo sapiens uh, is, is structured. Hmm. Um, and then the other, other information that is useful is that there was a find called uh, Neri Kotomi Boy is, is the nickname. This, uh, this individual, uh, the fossils were almost complete. So there was a very good uh, ability to estimate the size and uh, the, the body mass or the weight of this individual. And it was uh, concluded that had this boy uh, matured to adulthood, he would have ended up between five foot nine and five foot 11 inches in height and weighed between 176 and 183 pounds had he lived to maturity. So again, very descriptive, very reminiscent of what we'd expect uh, measurements to be on, on modern man. Right. Now, uh, here's here's the interesting thing. Um, there is a growing consensus, or I wouldn't say consensus or majority yet, but a growing group of evolutionists have actually now proposed that the Homo erectus classification be sunk or eliminated <laughs> with the fossils being combined or placed into the classification of Homo sapiens. This is a very, very controversial proposal, but there's actually very good evidence for it. And part of the reason is because um, there is uh, uh, a, a growing realization that Homo sapiens and Homo erectus fossils occur at the same location for extended period of times. Second, fossils dis displaying features of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens are common and the scientific literature admits that non-evolutionary factors, non-evolutionary factors are sufficient to explain the difference between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. And that is why even notable evolutionists have called for the sinking or the elimination of Homo erectus as the classification with the fossils to be put into Homo sapiens. Now, I want to uh, just show you a textbook here. And again, this, this information is never admitted or even mentioned in the, uh, the high school textbooks aimed at children. But what I'm showing here is a book called Paleoanthropology. It's the leading college textbook. It's uh, authored by uh, a uh, paleoanthropologist, Milford Wolpuff of the University of Michigan. He is the leading proponent uh, calling for the elimination of erectus as a separate classification and he's calling for those fossils, as I mentioned, to be placed into um, the Homo sapiens classification. So this would be hmm. an enormous um, move because it would basically eliminate all the subsequent claimed hominid forms that, that uh, apparently or supposedly lived uh, more recently than Homo erectus 
uh, who, who lived from about 2 million to about 300,000 years ago. So let me just read you a quote from Wolpoff, and it, it'll, it'll explain his thinking at, uh, very, very well, I think. He says, we regard the species distinction between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens as being problematic due to the difficulty in clearly distinguishing an actual boundary between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. We should either admit that the Homo erectus Homo sapiens boundary is arbitrary and use it non uh, and use non morphological criteria for determining it, or Homo erectus should be sunk. When he says sunk, he means eliminated. Sinking Homo erectus would carry the advantages of explicitly recognizing the arbitrariness of the boundary. More importantly, it would eliminate the necessity of relying on dates to determine which species a number of specimens belong to. Now, in the textbook I, sh I just showed you, he makes this reassignment of the Homo erectus, and, and I'm going to quote from his book. He says that Homo sapiens appears in East Africa nearly 2 million years ago hmm. and precedes the earliest appearance of Homo habilis. So here's a leading evolutionist. He's the author of the leading book on paleoanthropology used at the collegiate level. He says erectus should be sunk. It should be placed in Homo sapiens. And um, that, that basically wipes out all these claimed transitional forms that, that uh, appear on the scene after 2 million years ago. So it's a rather remarkable uh, uh, proposal, but it makes perfect sense based on the evidence. But it's it, again, I don't think we'll ever see that discussed in the high school biology textbooks because it shows what a, uh, what a, what bad evidence there really is to support all these claims that we've, we've seen since the time we were, were very young. So what we're saying is, unlike uh, climate science and vaccine science, uh, in evolution, it's not settled. So we can uh, we can ask questions in this field, apparently. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I, I make the statement in, in my book on uh, the Catholic assessment of, of evolution theory that my fear is that it'll be the, the Catholic clergy and, and teachers in Catholic institutions that are the last ones defending human evolution. But that's yes, right. yes, we see in, in the scientific literature. See that that's the interesting thing. the The scientific literature freely discusses the discusses the problems with each of these claimed transitional forms. Every one of them is discredited in the scientific literature. Therefore, using any reasonable standard, the whole thing collapses. But of course, you'll never see that admitted in the biology textbook uh, because the the intent is to indoctrinate, not to teach truthful science. You know, it's an interesting comment you say, though, about the, the priests and the sort of apologists will be the last ones defending evolutionary theory. And it makes sense in a sort of unfortunate way, because, you know, big places, and I'm not trying to throw stones here, but places like Catholic Answers and others who have done otherwise really great work. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they literally, literally put out series and done conferences um, where they're, you know, one of them was called their one of the episode series they did on their radio show was called evangelizing through evolution. I remember thinking to myself, first of all, that doesn't make any sense because evangelize evangelium refers to the gospel. Uh, so that's just kind of weird that you say we're going to evangelize with a disputed scientific theory. In fairness, maybe you say something like, you know, answering your questions on answering your questions on, you know, debate of creation evolution. Okay, fair enough if they're going to take that perspective. But to go that step further and say, we're literally going to do the work of the apostles, do the Great Commission, and do so through the lens of evolution. That just shows you that, you know, in the in, we, we say in the evolutionary world, they've made it their religion. Fair enough. But in the Catholic world, the Catholic apologetical world, they've blended it with the only true religion. And therefore, implicitly, and I understand the logic of this, it gains some sort of almost infallible status. Because if you've made your career as an apologist, a radio host, a podcast, or whatever, showing, you know, Catholic evolution is fine, um, then you've made that part of essentially what you believe when you say the creed. And that's a really big problem. And as you point out, funny enough, we're seeing the actual materialists themselves 
at least have enough credibility, intellectual honesty to say, we probably should give a second look here. Absolutely. It, it's a huge issue. And, and you ask yourself, well, what is behind this uh, almost dogmatic defense of evolution? And if you look at some of the authoritative statements uh, made by the magisterium, you'll see, I think, where the, the problem is occurring. Uh, the 1950 encyclical Humanae Generis by right. Pope Pius uh, XII, it warned of those who uncritically accept evolution theory out of fear of being considered ignorant mm -hmm. of the latest scientific findings. So I think pride is a big issue here. And once, yeah, if you're, you're an apologist or otherwise have taken a public stand supporting evolution, the tendency is rather than be humble and say, well, you know what? I haven't personally studied the literature uh, and I better do that before I, I say any more about whether the evidence does or does not support evolution theory or human evolution. The tendency is just to dig in heels and denounce any who uh, call you out as fundamentalist or, you know, going uh, going counter to church teaching, uh, just all kinds of excuses and and um, and pushback is, is found. But not only did did Humani Generous call for the theologian and scientist to study the evidence both for and against evolution, and that's what we're doing here. But even going back further, back to 1893 Encyclical uh, Providentissimus Deus by Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Paragraphs 18 and 22 of that encyclical, he called on the clergy to become familiar with the science because he understood that the Bible is being under attack by those who wish to scrutinize the scriptures and find error. So he understood the importance of, of priests uh, and others in religious institutions to understand what the evidence really showed forth. He also called upon those experts in any field of science whatsoever to come to the aid of the church. Mm -hmm. That's so right. Those and, I, those, and yeah, those calls were just basically ignored and continue to be so wide, widely. Exactly. And I keep harping back, you know, I've written extensively on the traditional doctrine of creation in my short career. It's kind of how I got into the, into this whole world of apologetics, I guess you could say anyway. And um, I remember hearing well, Pius XII, he gave permission for belief in evolution. So I kind of read the document myself. And no, he did not. Uh, Humana Generis is essentially his, it's his Pescendi. It's his, it's his, it's it's the updated oath. It's the, it's the updated uh, synthesis of all heresies condemnation um, in, in the vein of his, his predecessor. And, um, and paragraph 36 in that document, all it says is that, and it's a very limited freedom. And I say this on every episode in this series, but it has to be hammered through, mm -hmm. especially if someone is coming to this, not seeing the other episodes in the series. And I recommend you, you watch them all if you're coming in at a number later on in the series. He says in paragraph 36 that basically questions in a very cautionary way can be asked about the existence of, of, of living matter that was used in the formation of Adam, um, which is a completely reasonable question to ask because we know Adam is made from the soil, the dust, the slime, whatever the translation says. What is that matter? Look into it. Sounds good. Have some fun with it if, you, if that's your thing. But that's a very far cry from uh, molecules to man, uh, you know, ape-like creatures that are unrational to offspring that have a soul infused in some miraculous way. That's not even in the cards at all. And in the document, he castigates those who teach evolution as if it is a fact in other paragraphs. And sadly, we find um, these these mainstream Catholic apologists. I, I'm not I'm not accusing them of dishonesty. I don't know what they think. Maybe they. I mean, I get it. There's a million things to read, and they're just citing people and stuff, and they probably just believe this. It's kind of like mm -hmm. what they do with Augustine. I, I've read. I just finished narrating Anthony Esselin's translation of um, Confessions for Tan Books. And if you've ever, if anyone who's ever done audio narration to get a perfect reading. I probably read through that book three times through because you make so many mistakes, you go back. And I've read it on my own time personally in the past. I've read through that book about four times. And no, St. Augustine is not advocating for evolution. St. Augustine is advocating for an instantaneous creation that happens basically in the blink of an eye and then spends two or three books of that longer book trying to discuss the philosophical, the metaphysical reality of creation with timelessness and things, but it's not evolution, whatever it is. And then also he does defend the literal meaning of Genesis in a 
book called The Literal Meaning of Genesis. So there's a lot of yes. monkey business to use an evolutionary pun going on in this conversation. There, there certainly is. And, and speaking of um, Augustine, we, uh, we worked with uh, Hugh's group, um, the Colby Center, to produce a 17-hour DVD series called Foundations Restored. There's a whole episode of about 45 minutes evaluating uh, his, his view of creation and whether or not he was an evolutionist. And, and we agree totally with what you just said. Yes. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Is there more okay, on well, your list here? There, there is. Yeah. Let's, let's go, go back it. and let's finish off the rectus here. And um, so one of the questions that emerges is it's becoming clear based on what we've covered that these erectus fossils can be uh, placed into Homo sapiens classification. But one of the uh, questions that arises is, okay, well, what there, there is some difference in the Homo erectus appearance. Um, his, his cranial capacity also is, on average, about 300 cubic centimeters below that of modern man. Modern man's average cranial capacity is about 1,350 cubic centimeters, where erectus is just over 1,000 cubic centimeters. He also has the heavy uh, eyebrow ridges here. Some other other uh, smaller differences, but the question is, okay, well, John, if you're saying that that these are really belonging to Homo sapiens, how do you account for the differences in morphology or um, uh, shape and size of the fossils that are are commonly referred to as Homo erectus? This is a really really interesting uh, area, and um, part of the the puzzle was solved long ago, actually. Um, back in, uh, I think it was early 1970s, 1972, there were fossils discovered at a location called Cow Swamp in Australia. The interesting thing about these fossils is that they appeared 100% uh, uh, as Homo erectus, um, classified by all the evolution as Homo erectus. But then when the dating results came back, the fossils were found to be only 10,000 years old. And remember, in our timeline, we see that Homo erectus was supposed to have died out around 300,000 years ago and given way to Homo sapiens. So the question is, well, how, how on earth could Homo erectus have survived until just 10,000 years ago when it was supposedly locked in a battle of survival of the fittest with Homo sapiens and perhaps all these other transitional forms. Well, the story was kind of given away in a, a narrative or an editorial in uh, the periodical Nature, and it discussed many non-evolutionary factors that can give Homo sapiens a Homo erectus appearance. In mm -hmm. other words, evolution is not needed to explain the differences in appearance between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. Some of the factors that were mentioned include inbred communities, mm. low-grade anemia, genetic factors, and pathological uh, conditions. In other words, Nature, the leading uh, periodical, uh, scientific periodical in the world, was saying we can explain the differences between erectus and Homo sapiens using non-evolutionary factors. This, this uh, explanation has really become a very sound explanation in recent years. And I'll give one example shortly to, uh, to confirm that. But let's just assume for the time being that erectus fossils can be uh, sunk into Homo sapiens. That means that if we accept evolutionist dating, Homo sapiens dates to at least 2 million years ago, actually 2.5 based on what we discussed about Homo rudolfensis. That means that all these other intermediate intermediary uh, forms are in danger, how can they be transitioning to Homo sapiens if Homo sapiens lived at least 2.5 million years ago? Well, these, these other claimed transitional forms will go away very quickly. When we talk about uh, uh, Homo ergaster, for example, this is simply the name given to uh, several East African uh, fossils that are otherwise known as Homo erectus. Mm. Um, there, there really wasn't a proper designation or, or um, uh, explanation given as to why these fossils should be classified as anything other than Homo erectus. Therefore, if Homo erectus can be sunk into Homo sapiens, Homo ergaster can be similarly sunk. Um, homo, homo antecessor 
uh, is based on a find in Spain. He's described as having, having a totally modern face, even more human-like or, or resembling Homo sapiens than Erectus, which was already sunk, so he can obviously go. Homo heidelbergensis, uh, his, uh, he's also known as archaic Homo sapiens. So as the name suggests, um, these fossils can easily be uh, uh, collapsed into Homo sapiens as well. Then we get to the interesting case of uh, the ne Neanderthals. Um, these I've, I've been called were... a Neanderthal before, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and not only by your wife, maybe, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is an interesting history. These fossils date back uh, to the 1850s. They were found in Germany. In 1911 through 1913, the, some of the fossils were reconstructed, and they were deliberately reconstructed or put together to uh, make the fossils or the specimen look very ape-like, hunched over, mm -hmm. um, brooding, uh, the, the head you know tilted over. And it wasn't until the 1950s that it was discovered that these fossils were really uh, fraudulently or I would say very inaccurately uh, reconstructed. There was a, a famous article that uh, was published in 1957. Uh, let me just read the conclusion there. The conclusion was that there is no valid evidence or a reason for the assumption that the posture of Neanderthal man differed significantly from that of present day men. There's nothing to justify the common assumption that the Neanderthal man was other than a fully erect biped. If it could be reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he were bathed, shaved, and dressed in modern clothing, it is doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than some of the other citizens. So again, we always have to be uh, aware of preconceived bias and um, just philosophical bias uh, when it comes to interpreting these these fossils. It was, it's also known now that based on some DNA that was recovered from Neanderthal bones, that Neanderthals and humans, uh, Homo sapiens, were at least 99.7% identical when it comes to their DNA. So he also falls as a legitimate uh, legitimate claim transitional form. Okay, the last two we'll briefly talk about here on our timeline um, are two interesting uh, and recent finds um, called Homo naledi. He was found in uh, South Africa. And then the other one is, is called Ho Homo floresiensis. He's nicknamed the Hobbit because he's so small. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, naledi was uh, it created a lot of fanfare because it was found in a cave system, and it was claimed that the specimen performed ritual burial, and this was debated for a time, and then a second burial cave was was um, was found and publicized, and so most people do accept that these uh, these specimens performed ritual burial, and yet the the uh, specimen was very small in stature. And uh, it was it was um, projected or predicted at the time that Naledi would date to oh probably about two million years or perhaps a little bit younger, um, but it turned out in the end that Naledi was actually very recent, somewhere between two hundred thirty six thousand and three hundred thirty five thousand years ago. Well, that's the date that that covers the date at which even evolutionists. Uh, admit that Homo sapiens uh, appeared on the scene at 300,000 years ago. And as we mentioned, uh, arguably go, goes back to at least 2.5 million years ago, based on what we've discussed so far. Um, so Naledi it was a very small specimen, but it could not have been the predecessor to modern man or Homo sapiens, given the dates of his existence. The same thing with Floresiensis, the hobbit, which only dates to about 12,000 years ago. And the interesting thing about the Hobbit was its small size. Um, it, and it, it had a small cranial capacity of a, a little over 400 cubic centimeters. Well, what is becoming increasingly clear is that the same explanation that we talked through as to why erectus fossils, they differ from Homo sapiens, also explains why Naledi and Floresiensis are so small and different in stature and size from Homo sapiens. And that is their small size uh, is attributed most likely to population inbreeding as well as um, 
calorie limits on the calorie intake that they were able to uh, to obtain, which would produce a, a selective forces for uh, increasingly smaller size in both both of these specimens. So so again, it's small population inbre inbreeding and uh, just really the lack of sufficient calorie intake that probably explains why there appears to be differences in morphology in all these specimens, all of which except for Homo habilis rightly can be sunk into Homo sapiens. So when we do that, we'll come down here and show that we're basically attributing, we're reassigning the fossils in all these claimed transitional forms into Homo sapiens, except for Homo habilis, which as we said, consisted of some fossils that are um, appeared to be Homo erectus, which was sunk into Homo sapiens. Other fossils belonging to the classification should rightly be assigned to the Australopithecines. When we do that, we come up with a single spe species in the Homo genus, as we would expect if Genesis is true and that man was directly and immediately created by God out of the dust of the earth. Wow. So basically, um, there's strong reasons to get rid of essentially all of these transitional fossils, so to speak, whether they be just Homo sapiens with different characteristics because of, you know, reasons X, Y, and Z, or animals, which are not human beings. Um, and so, uh, you know, if someone's watching this and they're not an, a young earth creationist, okay, fair enough. We haven't gone over that yet on this episode of, uh, of the series. Nonetheless, the evidence does not support the evolution of the, the various species leading to man. So at, at least you're going to have to interpret the Bible. And in fairness, there is a precedent for this from the Pontifical Biblical Commission about sort of the, the metaphorical meaning of the word day, which I've talked about in, in other articles. So you can play with ages, I guess, from a strictly scriptural perspective. Okay, fine. But still, what you see on the scene when we look at the, 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 the material evidence is that it's just from the jump, it's human beings, and then there's animals, which is exactly what the scriptures tell us. That, that, that's right. And I think it's important for Catholics to just sit back and, and ask themselves, well, why did I ever depart from the teaching of the church for 19 centuries? And if we go back and look historically at what happened, it really was because of the claims of Darwin, who called Christianity a, a damnable uh, doctrine, and, um, that evolution kind of won the day in scientific circles. And this quickly came in uh, to the church through modernism and other, other, uh, other problem problems and kind of, kind of still sits there, even though there really remains no evidence supporting evolution. In fact, the last 30 years, the increasing evidence supports um, going away from any claims of human evolution altogether. Yeah. So really it becomes, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, I'm an evolutionist, I'm a Thomist because I believe in the harmony of truth. Well, what they have done is is not study directly for themselves. They've accepted that evolution is, is true, wanting to conform their theology to the claims of evolution. They said, well, I'm going to throw away the literal interpretation of Genesis and and there I've harmonized science and faith. Actually, they hold errant positions, I think, on both the science and now their view of Genesis and, and other doctrines. Well, and also in uh, to go back to Pius X, in Pishendi, he does say that, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he uses the term a true Catholic or a real Catholic. He said, and whether you, you can translate it as be revolted or made nauseous by, depending on uh, where you read the encyclical, a true Catholic is revolted by or made nauseous by the, appra the appraisal, the approval of the rationalists, i.e. the evolutionists. So one of these famous... Uh, conservative Catholic commentators made a video about me being an unsophisticated individual because I pushed this creationism thing and that's going to lead people away from the church. And one of his, one of his claims was, look, there's these atheists making fun of Kennedy Hall because he doesn't understand the Big Bang Theory the way they do. And I say, I really don't care what the rationalists say and it actually disgusts mm -hmm. me if they think I'm okay with them. Now, obviously, if you convince them, that's one thing, but I don't want to play on their, you know, play by their rules and be acceptable by their rules per se because that's just not what I'm interested in. Right, right. And and you mentioned the term rationalist, and that's so important to understand that we're not combating evolutionary thought simply proposed or held by materialists and atheists. But again, if we go back to the philosophy of Descartes, 
who was the first introduced rationalism into the area of philosophy. Rationalism basically holds that there is nothing that exceeds the ability of the human mind to comprehend. Mm -hmm. So if we accept that as our fundamental philosophical approach to all of reality, what does that mean for accepting biblical miracles, biblical prophecies? We can't ever come to an understanding of how God really created other than what he's told us, but how he really did that. So we have to come up with a naturalistic explanation that our mind can comprehend, and that basically is evolution theory. So again, if you go back to this critical time frame of between 1870 and 1900, the eventual combination of, of modernism, but if you go back to Proventismus Deus, for example, paragraph 10, uh, Pope Leo XIII talks about uh, that we must understand who we are contending against. He said we have to meet the rationalists, holder the old holder of the old heresies and so forth. But yes, yeah, so so he, when we talk about modernism, the heresy of modernism, it's really a combination of of evolution evolution theory combined with rationalism. That that forms what I call in one of my books here the Darwinian narrative. So basically, Darwinism completed two errant schools of philosophical thought. One is materialism. The other is rationalism. And once once Darwin wrote and uh, became widely accepted, that brought in all the other problems that we see both within the church and in society. Excellent. Um, well, is there anything else on the list that we need to go through? Is that just about cover it? You know, we can, we can talk very briefly, um, and I won't, I won't read the scientific quotes here, but let's just look at the, timeline here in the Australia Pythocenes. Sure. Now, um, one really interesting thing is that there were there were some finds in the country of Georgia uh, starting in the year, uh, I think it was 2000 through 2013. There were five skulls that were found in the country of Georgia. And I want to display those because it really raised a quandary for the evolutionists. So here are the five skulls. You can see how they they vary enormously as far as their their size, their morphology, or their shape. Some of these resemble classic Homo erectus. Others uh, were were said to more closely resemble Homo habilis or even Homo rudolfensis. But the thing is that all five of these skulls were dated to the same time frame, about 1.85 million years ago. And they were found at the very same site. So that would tell us that even though there was enormous variation in these skulls at the single site, they would have been from the same species. So the question was for the discovery team, how on earth should they classify these skulls? And what they concluded uh, was described by in science as setting off a small bomb in the field. What they concluded was that all five of these uh, skulls should be classified as Homo erectus, which we've argued should be reclassified into Homo sapiens. But then they went on to describe that what is probably happening in the fossil record in East Africa is that um, too much splitting or diversification is being read into the fossils, especially where you have comparison of fossils found at separate sites. Because what these fossils from Georgia, these five fossil skulls from Georgia show us is that even in the same population, at the same site, there can be enormous variety of morphology. Therefore, they, they basically concluded what I've, uh, I've explained here, that all of these supposedly different species are really all of the same species, uh, all of a single species. They classified that single species as Homo erectus. But as we've discussed, Homo erectus can be class, uh, collapsed into Homo sapiens. So you think, well, now how on earth would any evolutionist ever agree to what I've been uh, explaining here, that basically you only have one legitimate um, uh, species in the Homo genus? And the answer is that you can still classify yourself as a Homo or as an evolutionist because you have all these Australopithecine fossils that you've been claim uh, morphed into or evolved into Homo over a period of, of billions of years. Um, I'll just briefly describe here uh, Afarensis. This is the so-called Lucy that was discovered in 1974. The interesting thing about Lucy was that she was claimed to be a permanent biped or an upright walker. 
But the the fossil evidence doesn't suggest that at all. In fact, the only reason she she was uh, able to convince people that she was an upright biped <laughs> was because of the footprints that were found um, more than a thousand miles away called the Laetoli footprints. These were dated to about 3.6 million years ago. So that would have fit within the supposed time frame that Afarensis walked around. And the the logic used was, well, there were no uh, uh, homo species on, on the horizon or on the field at 3.6 million years ago, since Lucy's type was the only type known. Therefore, Lucy must have made these footprints. Well, the interesting thing is that if you go back and read the description of these Laetoli footprints, they are described as e exactly identical to those made by modern man. And there was, there was all kinds of debate back and forth in the scientific literature. Eventually, though, because there, were, uh, there, there was strong, um, strong pushing to, to, uh, to ascribe those footprints to Lucy's kind, she kind of won the day. And, and to, this, to this day is uh, dis or presented in museums as an upright walker. But the actual evidence um, goes strongly against that. Let me just read a, a conclusion of the most in-depth uh, study ever performed on the uh, the fossils of the uh, the Lucy kind here. And basically, uh, let me find this here briefly. Okay, so this is, um, this is the conclusion for the most in-depth uh, study done by Jack Stern and Randall Sussman from the State University of New York. It's a 40-page report in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. Their overall conclusion was the afarensis uh, possessed anatomic characteristics that indicate a significant adaptation for movement in the trees. Other structural features point to a mode of terrestrial bi bipedality that involved less extension at the hip and knee than occurs in modern humans. The Hadar hominid, Lucy, was vitally dependent upon the trees for protection and or sustenance. And in, in the book, I go through uh, just characteristic after characteristic of uh, reasons why she could not have made those footprints uh, in Laetoli that were properly, should have been properly ascribed to Homo sapiens and not the Australopithecines. Well, so so Lucy, this this apparent, you know, the claimed mother of us all, uh, according to the evolutionists, really falls apart once you read through the scientific literature. That leaves primarily Africanus then as the, the next possible uh, uh, predecessor of the Homo genus. The problem is Africanus was even more ape-like and more primitive than Lucy, and Lucy was its supposed ancestor. So all of these claim... Australopithecines fall apart. They simply were bipeds that went extinct and left no evolutionary uh, descendants. So basically, once you go through all of the work, you'll see that um, there really is no convincing evidence at all for human evolution to have occurred. There are other more ancient uh, claimed fossils here, but those those also fall fall apart. So again, in the end, what we end up with is a picture that looks um, very much like we'd expect if uh, Genesis account is true and human evolution did not happen. So that's basically the thrust of the, the, the evaluations that I uh, present in my books. Well, that's amazing. And again, we'll make sure we link to your literature in the show notes for this podcast. Uh, John, this has been exceptional. Um, again, you know, we're showing by their own methods why there are problems with what they, with what they say, and this isn't. You're not you're not citing, you know, uh, Joe Blow's blog dot com or something like that. You know, you're looking from all the decades in sort of the let's call it the modern evolutionary period, going back almost 60, 70, 80 years, showing the debates, showing the mainstream literature, showing the contemporary literature calling for basically something relatively consistent with the creationist narrative. And this is happening in real time in universities and faculties and research departments across the world as we speak. Um, so this has been enlightening. Um, can, before we go, I want to ask a question though, because mm -hmm. so in this, in this show, I mean, we, we'd mentioned Genesis and things like that, you know, just kind of, this is obviously a Catholic show, but we could take out those few claims that we made about the Bible. And this is just simply the facts. This is just simply 
scientific literature and making a case that way. What's it been like for you trying to discuss this with people who are committed to the narrative? I mean, when you just kind of use the facts, do they give you the time of day or is there a, or is there a block there? Oh, there, there's definitely a block. Um, and what I found is really the question is, are you a truth seeker? Are you really looking to find out the tr where the truth lies in terms of your philosophical uh, uh, philosophy of, of life, your worldview? Where does the evidence really lead? And so I've met atheists who are much, much more open to what does the evidence really show than some Catholics I've, I've met. But, um, but thankfully, through you know, Hugh Owen and working with others like him, uh, there, there seems to be a growing, growing momentum to show where the scientific evidence leads, not just in paleoanthropology, but Big Bang cosmology and on and on and on. So, yes, it, uh, it really is important for people to be seeking the truth and to be humble enough to admit that, well, maybe what I've held for a decade or two or more maybe that really wasn't based on solid evidence. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, so in the future, if you ever want to come on my show, if you got something you want to talk about, I know you're always doing research and doing presentation stuff, please let me know. Obviously, we've been talking on email, and uh, I'd be more than happy. This is wonderful stuff. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, check the links in, in the show notes for this podcast. You'll find everything you need to know about uh, John's work, also the Colbe Center. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, just know that you could have seen it sooner if you subscribe to my Substack, which the link for that is in the description as well. And um, I think that's all I've got, John. Um, so I, I thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to uh, speak with you on email and then finally kind of talk virtually in person here. And we're, uh, we're recording this sort of later at night on a Sunday because we had to make our schedules work. So there's a lot of goodwill here to make this happen. So I really appreciate that. Oh, ha happy to be on, Kennedy. So nice to uh, speak with you uh, over the internet here. And uh, thank you so much for delving into this this issue and the detail you have. I thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I always end the show by saying, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless. God bless you.